Thanks, Ben, and thanks to Boulder Bookstore. And thank you all for coming on behalf of Local Food Show. It's, it's not easy to say who Carolyn Baker is. Uh, we first met Carolyn at a peak oil conference in New York in 2006. And when we brought uh, Tim Bennett and Sally Erickson to Boulder for a screening of their documentary film, What a Way to Go, Life at the End of Empire. Anybody remember that one? Well, and we also asked them to host a three-day workshop here, and we were amazed that Carolyn chose to travel all the way from the Northeast to attend that, that workshop. And we were even more surprised a few months later when she packed up and moved to Boulder. Um, for us, Carolyn has become a trusted friend, a neighbor, and a co-conspirator. We, we feel very privileged to share this journey with her, and it's an honor to introduce her tonight. A little background, Carolyn was a PhD psychotherapist in private practice for 17 years, and a professor of psychology and history for 10 years. She's the author of a, a recent series of books, uh, including Sacred Demise, Walking the Spiritual Path of Industrial Civil, uh, Civilization's Collapse, Navigating the Coming Chaos, a handbook for inner transition, and most recently, Collapsing Consciously, Transformative Truths for Turbulent Times. Carolyn manages the website Speaking Truth to Power at carolynbaker.net and publishes the Daily News Digest, which is a collection of independent news stories focusing on unprecedented uh, transitions and options for navigating an uncertain future. And we've come to rely on the Daily News Digest a great deal. She's been uh, writing a regular column entitled Collapsing Consciously for Collapse.net. And for the last few years, Carolyn has curated a stream of local and national food-related news on our local Food Shift website. And as of last week, Carolyn is now the host of the Lifeboat Hour, the legendary online radio show uh, created by the late Mike Rupert. Some of you may remember uh, Mike's famous website, From the Wilderness, of which Carolyn was the managing editor. I could also mention that she tells stories with an African drum, <laughs> leads workshops on emotional resilience and on relationships in the long emergency. She's got a life coaching and spiritual direction practice uh, based in Boulder, but she, she speaks to people all over the country. She also convenes an extraordinary group here in Boulder called Growing Resilience, in which I'm delighted to be a participant. It may be the only group in Boulder where the prospect of near-term human extinction is glibly and frequently referred to as NTE. Quite, quite amazing. I'd say that Carolyn is one of a very small handful of writers and speakers who have helped to pioneer a transformational response to our collective predicament on this planet a time in which as many as 200 species a day are going extinct, and in which it appears the human species itself could soon end up among their numbers. Carolyn has shown that it is not enough simply to be aware of our plight, but that how each of us responds to all of this is a matter of ultimate importance. She's devoted her life to being a wise and transformative guide through this difficult passage. And recently, I, I came across a, a quote from an interview with Der, Derek Jensen. And I think these words kind of epitomize the spirit of what Carolyn is doing with her life. Derek said, no matter what happens after I die, I only live in this form once, right now. And so I don't want to die with books still in me, and I don't want to die with honesty left in me. And this culture is killing the planet, and failure is not an option. And I don't want to look back and say, if I just would have done that, 
maybe the salmon would have survived. Carolyn, I think, embodies this same kind of deep, passionate commitment to life. Please join me in welcoming Carolyn Baker and her latest book, Collapsing Consciousness. Good evening, everybody. What are you doing here? I mean, you could be home watching Dancing with the Stars or The Voice or, you know, any number of other things. You could be sitting over at the bar having a good drink, you know, but you come here to talk about collapsing consciously. Thank you, Michael, for that wonderful introduction. And hopefully, uh, when, by the time you leave tonight, you'll, you'll have a sense of why you came, why, why there's something uh, more than just collapse to talk about as we start at that place and let that take us on a journey to somewhere else that is really quite filled with possibilities. So um, I'm proud to say, I want to say first of all, I'm very proud to be with this book uh, in a series that was put together by Andrew Harvey. Maybe some of you know Andrew Harvey. Um, it's a, a sacred activism series, and um, there are going to be many books in that series, but in this first segment, uh, there's this book and Charles Eisenstein's book, A More Beautiful World That Our Hearts Know Is Possible, and another book by an amazing young man uh, who works in New York City with homeless youth, a man named Adam Bucko, called Occupy Spirituality. Uh, so we got some, some good things coming down the line with this series, and uh, I am very, very proud to be in this series with these other folks. <clears throat> well, Michael uh, gave you a little bit of information about um, how I got on this journey, and it is a journey. Um, back in 2000, he mentioned Mike Rupert. I, I met Mike Rupert back in 2000, and... Um, uh, at that time, I was living in the Southwest, and I was teaching, and I was just kind of your basic mainstream liberal. And uh, then there was the, the, the 2000 election, or should I say selection. <laughs> and something in me knew there was something wrong with that picture. And, uh, you know, but I thought about it, and, and one day, I don't know why, it was in October of 2000, I was sitting at my computer on a Sunday afternoon, and I'm surfing the internet, and one thing led to another, I can't even remember what I was Googling, but I started on the path of CIA and drugs. And I was looking at all these stories that were very well documented about uh, drug trafficking and the CIA's role in that. And one of the guys um, that I saw, uh, whose name was, was in this group of things I was looking up, uh, was a man named Celerino Castillo, who had been a DEA agent and was uh, living in Texas. And I was living in Texas at that time, perish the thought. Um, and so his phone number was there. And I thought, I'll give him a call tomorrow morning. It's Sunday. I'll call him tomorrow morning. So I called him the next morning and expected to get a voicemail, and I got him. And we talked for about an hour. And he told me some very hair-raising stories. And he said, one person you must meet and connect with is Mike Rupert. Well, I didn't know who Mike Rupert was. And so I got online and looked, and I discovered the website From the Wilderness. And I was very impressed with how well-documented all the stories were. And I became a subscriber of From the Wilderness. And then I emailed Mike at one point, and I said, you know, I'm, I've got Christmas break, and I'm coming out to Los Angeles to see some friends. He was in L.A. at the time. I'd like to take you to lunch. So I met him. We went to lunch. And we started this, this connection. And... Um, in a couple of years, he asked me to write some stories from the wilderness, and one thing led to another. And uh, I was regularly writing for From the Wilderness, all the time researching what I was reading about from him and other places. And then in 2006, I got my own website, and I, I started, I was so um, 
drawn to alternative media because, you know, it was the Bush administration at that time and it's kind of like you don't know what you're being told and what's really true. And uh, so I started my own website in 2006 called Speaking Truth to Power and I started publishing the Daily News Digest that Michael mentioned. Then I saw that documentary which Michael also mentioned, What a Way to Go, Life at the End of Empire. And up to that time, before I saw that documentary, I was looking at different problems like the Iraq War, like the Bush administration's selection, like the housing bubble, like all these different things. And I was just kind of seeing them as separate problems. When I saw what a way to go, I began to understand that what we're dealing with is not a bunch of separate problems, but a whole scenario, the collapse of industrial civilization and the paradigm on which it's built. And with my training in psychotherapy, I thought, well, you know, there's a lot of people online writing about storing food and storing water and getting guns and doing this and doing that when this collapse take pl takes place. But how is this going to impact people emotionally and spiritually? So I began to make a lot of notes, and then I wrote this book, Sacred Demise, Walking the Spiritual Path of Industrial Civilization's Collapse. And I thought, probably sell about 20 books. Uh, turns out it was much more successful than I thought. And uh, then I moved to Boulder, and I was very involved with transition at the time, and, and really liked the transition handbook and what transition was about. And uh, I thought, you know, I need to take this material further and talk about inner transition. So I decided to write Navigating the Coming Chaos, a handbook for inner transition. Does it resemble just a little bit the transition handbook, for those of you who have seen it? Uh, and that was intentional. And uh, I, was for, I was fortunate to have um, Andrew Harvey write the foreword for this. Well, uh, then I thought, you know, I've always wanted to write a book of reflections. And so I thought, you know, I'd like to write a book of reflections on how we can fortify ourselves 365 days a year as we deal with, with what's in front of us. So I submitted a manuscript to North Atlantic Books with 365 meditations and 17 essays. And they said, whoa, that's really a big book for the first one with us. So uh, we'll take the 17 essays, and why don't you pull out 52 of these reflections, which was like pulling out parts of my body, <laughs> and, and we'll put it in a hard copy, and then we'll take the other 313 reflections and put it in an e-book, and that's what they did. So um, one of the things that, that uh, this book says is, uh, on the back as it's described, Collapsing Consciously is a manual for making meaning and generating joy, especially in situations that feel hopelessly devoid of both. What do you mean, making meaning and generating joy? Aren't we talking about doom and gloom? Well, yes, on one hand, we are. Um, and on the other hand, I see this collapse of industrial civilization and now of the ecosystems as an opportunity. And I don't say that in a glib way or in a, you know, happy-faced way. Um, I see it as very serious, and I also see it as a spiritual and emotional opportunity. An opportunity for us to go deeper into ourselves and connect deeper with each other than we might have otherwise. And it's an opportunity for the ego, the human ego, to die, to shrink, to be reduced, and the sacred, the divine within, to come forth and expand. Now, yeah, I know we need an ego. You know, if anybody tells you, I've gotten rid of my ego, uh, you ask them, how did you find your way to the bathroom and who's got the car keys? Because we need an ego to function. But problem is, everything about this culture feeds the ego this false self, and, and the divine, the sacred, 
the greater self gets obscured. And so as the paradigm that holds all of this ego building stuff up begins to crumble, and we are left with what? Well, we're left with what's really true, what's really solid, what's really authentic, and that is the sacred. And if we don't have a connection with that, um, it's going to impact us in very painful ways. So um, what I like to do is I like to tell stories with the African drum, as Michael mentioned. And uh, there's a favorite story. I know quite a few stories now, but there's a favorite one that just keeps coming back to me that I want to share with you. And those of you who are familiar with Clarissa Pinkola Estes, she's our neighbor somewhere around here, uh, wrote Women Who Run With the Wolves. Uh, there's a wonderful story in there called Skeleton Woman. And I'd like to tell that story. And what I do when I tell stories is I ask you to just listen to it very innocently. Um, you know, when we were little kids, nobody said, OK, this is the way you listen to a story, right? We just, oh, wow, story. Oh, tell me again. Uh, so I'd like you to just see if you can listen to it that way. Don't listen to it in a chronological way, you know, like there's going to be an exam or something. Um, and there may be parts that you don't even hear or you forget, but notice what grabs you. Notice when you have some sort of sensation in your body or you have some, something that sort of, ugh, wow, rocks you in some way. Or something that you're really drawn to, like, oh, wow, I really like that. So I'm going to tell the story. We'll take some time to just really sit with it and see how it feels, and then we'll talk about it a bit. And then... Um, We'll talk a little bit more about collapsing consciously. Now, this is all very related to collapsing consciously. In fact, this story is all about collapsing consciously. I like to say once upon a time, in a time before digital time, in a time before real time, in a time when people had so much more time than they have in this time, in that time, there was a fisherman from the Inuit tribe who was out in his kayak, gently sailing around an inlet, looking to catch a fish. He had put the line over the edge of the kayak, and he was just kind of sitting there waiting for some action. And he was having fantasies about what might happen if he caught a really big fish. He was thinking about what a hero he would be in his tribe. He could bring a fish home that might feed most of the people for most of the winter. And so, as he sat there fantasizing, there was a tug on the line. And he felt that tug, and immediately he turned around to the other end of the kayak to grab his fisherman's net so that he could scoop up this huge catch that he knew he was going to get. And when he turned back to scoop up the catch, oh my goodness, was he surprised because just over the edge of the kayak was this skull. Its teeth were caught in the edge of the kayak and, and it, it looked like a skeleton. And he got scared and he began to paddle toward the shore. And he paddled and he paddled and he paddled, forgetting that the line was attached to the skeleton. And as he paddled, if you had been there, you would have seen that it looked like this skeleton had risen up out of the water and was chasing him across the water. And he paddled as fast as he could. And he got to the shore and he jumped out of his kayak. And the skeleton followed him. And he ran across the tundra. And he ran across the pieces of dried meat that were laying there on the ground in the village. And he spotted his igloo. And he fell in his stomach and slid into the door of his igloo and landed against the back of the door. And he laid there for a moment and he went, oh, I got rid of that nightmare. 
after a long time, or a short time, or whatever time it was, he looked up and decided to light his whale oil lamp. So he went across the room and he lit his whale oil lamp and there in the soft whale light, he saw on the other side of the igloo a pile of bones, all tangled up every which way. And somehow <clears throat> a feeling of compassion came over him. And he reached out his grimy fisherman's hands and he began to untangle the bones. First the toes, and then the feet, and then the legs, and then the arms, the hands, the fingers, until all of the bones were in the right place. And then he took his sealskin robe and covered up the skeleton. And he didn't know why, but he began to feel very tired. And so he went to his bed and he slithered down under one of the sealskin robes there and he fell asleep. The whale oil light remained and across the room, the skeleton woman saw this man sleeping in his bed. And you know, sometimes when we sleep, we dream. And sometimes when we dream, we cry. And suddenly a tear began to run down his face. The skeleton woman got up and crawled across the room, up to that man's bed, to the side of his face, and she began to drink his tear. And then she got on top of him and she reached into his chest and she pulled out his heart and she put it between her hands like a drum and she began to drum and beat on his heart and pray at the same time that she was drumming and she prayed flesh 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 and suddenly flesh began to appear on her body and hair and big breasts and all the things that women really need. And then she crawled down under that sealskin robe and they made sweet love. And the next day they went away together in his kayak and they were never seen again. No one knows where they went. Now, is this story true? Well, this story is told and has been told for hundreds of years by the Inuit people. And I don't know if it's true, but I know that this is what the people say. And if the people don't know what is so, who does? <laughs> Just take a minute to be with the story. And let's hear what grabbed you, what you noticed, what you liked, what was yucky, what, what you had a charge around one way or the other. I can say something. Um, I was touched by his compassion for a bundle of bones. And then I was touched by her compassion. Touched by his compassion for a bundle of bones and her compassion for a tear. What else? Yeah. It reminded me of a dream that I had years and years ago about being in bed with the skeletons. And so I'm just really absorbing the idea that this is a collective thing and I think I'll go back to my dream journal and see all the other details around it and see what it means and I'm hearing it again now. It just feels 
very real and makes me feel really conscious of my own skeletal system and how it's connected to dream time. Yeah, and it's really wonderful to keep dream journals because you can go back to them years later and realize, oh my goodness, I didn't see this, or wow, I forgot that. Yeah, so good for you. Yeah, what else? Yep. The, the image that really jumped out at me was the, the, uh, the skeleton chasing the boat and, and how sometimes what we're terrified of and try to run from turns out to be a great gift. I think that's kind of the nutshell of the whole story. and that's, that's the crux of the whole story. Yeah. But I'm sure there's more. You know, Clarissa Pingola Estes spends about 100 pages in the book talking about this one story. So, and I encourage you, if you have the book, to go look at it and dig, it, dig out the, the good stuff. Yeah? To say what really struck me was the flesh, 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 flesh. Because entering this conversation, what drew me to it was my sense that this would be a pragmatic conversation in, and not just a spiritual conversation. And so I loved that what for me was underscored was this. I get it. I'm, I'm spirit in a skin bag. This is, this is where, right. this is what's going to get the work done. I can nail this all Exactly. <laughs> The embodied, the embodied work. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. You sound a little juvenile, but I was pleased that in the end they made sweet love. <laughs> because I mean, they, he had reconciled himself with his faith and was able to go with it. Yes. Well, they go from this chase, you know, and trying to escape the skeleton to really consummating, really coming together. Yeah, Scott? Yeah, I, I like everything I've heard. And the other piece for me is that it's all a dream. It's all a dream? Yeah. It's dreaming is really kind of what makes, makes the world go around. What do you mean by that? It's all a dream. Because it is and it isn't. I mean, it's sort of like you know, creating our own reality. Mm -hmm. And just the acknowledging the, the, the power of dreams. It's not to undermine it, you know, but to, to just give credit to that, that power of kind of creating our own reality and these different ways of knowing, this different consciousness that comes out in that, in that state. Felt like a part of the story. Good, thank you. Let's take one more. Anybody else? Yeah, Martin. I mean, yeah, Prentice. Preston. <laughs> I was struck by the drumming. I thought that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Carolyn, you had your hand up. What really struck me was the fishing line wrapped around the skeletal bones. And it just depicted what we've done to our world, created this huge mess. And, you know, he was willing to very gently <coughs> unravel that. And I think that's what, that's what it's about for us, to mm -hmm. gently unravel the mess that Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm losing my, my video audio. <laughs> Can you still hear me? Can you still hear me back there? Test? Hello, hello? Okay, all right. I've got, I'm, I'm totally wired. I've got his video and I've got the general. Okay. So, um, I don't know if we can literally unravel what we have done 
Um, this the month of April, we well last year we passed 400 parts per million in terms of CO2 in the in the atmosphere. In last month, we passed 400 parts again. We're we're staring a lot of skeletons in the face. And rather than trying to run from them, um, I believe that the real work, as we think about collapse, whether it's collapse of industry, whether it's collapse of economy, energy, or the climate, or the ecosystems, our real work is to turn around and face these skeletons, um, these things that really represent death in, on so many levels and turn to them and, and open ourselves to what they are teaching us about ourselves, even if we don't physically survive. Because, you know, it's never really been completely about physical survival, and it certainly isn't now. What it's about, William Stafford says it so well, and I use a lot of poetry in the book and in my work. William Stafford says, there is a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you're pursuing, and you have to explain about the thread. But it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen. People get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you can do stops time's unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. William Stafford is an American poet who I think was highly underrated and uh, wrote some of the most brilliant, deep poetry that just sounds, sounds kind of simple, you know, until you really get into it. So it's about the thread. That thread in all of us that is greater than what's going on around us, to which we not, now have to turn and embrace and utilize. And I see us as, as having to do two things. To really stay with the question, who am I? Who do I want to be as the, all of this unfolds and is unfolding? What did I come here to do? What is my purpose? How can I serve? And one of the things I've been talking about lately is the H word. Oh, dare I use the word hospice. We may be, as a species, in hospice. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. But I have found that word much less scary over the last year or so, not only as I've looked at the reality of possibility of near-term extinction, but also as I've witnessed people in hospice. A year ago today, a dear friend of mine died, and she had been in hospice for several months and put herself there voluntarily, and I sort of watched as I talked to her every other day for the last month of her life and I sort of watched what was going on and I saw a quality of life that she had never been able to live. I saw her really receiving love and, and really doing service around her when she felt well enough to do that. Um, I saw her making friends and having quality time to reflect and she even said, I can't remember the exact words, but it was something to the effect of, this has almost been the best time of my life. And so as we face these uncertainties, these are the questions that I'm inviting us to really, really be with. As I wrote Navigating the Coming Chaos, that's a book of tools. And I looked at five fundamental emotions that we are facing and will continue to face 
as all of this unraveled. Fear, anger, grief, despair, and the one that may surprise you, joy. And I recently did a webinar called Be Befriending the Dark Emotions. And it was about dealing directly with our fear, anger, grief, and despair. And learning the tools to work with those so that we build emotional resilience. And out of that comes a new texture, a new quality, a new capacity for joy. And one of the emotions I'm really fond of right now, because people keep coming to, it, to me with it, is grief. How can you look at 200 species a day and not feel profound grief? And much of the dis-ease and emotional pain in our culture, I believe, is unmetabolized grief. So anything that we can do to feel our grief, to allow our grief. You know, in some cultures, it's believed that grief is a public thing and that you need to share it with the community because if you don't get it out with the community, it toxifies the community. The dagger of people in West Africa believe that. So I'm going to read just one um, of these reflections from the book. And then I'm just going to open it up to some questions, comments. So this is the very first one after the 17 essays. And I start out with a little small segment of Rumi, who says, this we have now is not imagination. This is not grief or joy, not a judging state or an elation or sadness. Those come and go. This is the presence that doesn't. In other words, the threat. <laughs> what is the presence of which Rumi speaks? Words sometimes used synonymously are sacred, spirit, the transcendent. All suggest the nearness of something greater than the rational mind and the human ego. In this excerpt from one of Rumi's longer poems, he assures us that the presence is eternal and never falters and never leaves. Whatever our feeling state, our mental preoccupation, or our physical condition, whether we are aware of the presence or not, it remains. The presence is always with us, even in the current unraveling and even if we are only sometimes with the presence. We can consciously connect with the presence through meditation, through intentional engagement with nature, or by allowing ourselves to experience beauty through art, music, poetry, or other far forms of creative expression in which we allow beauty to touch and inspire us. We cannot control our experience of presence, but we may ask it to visit us, and we can open to however it manifests. I will not let you go until you bless me, said Jacob, wrestling with the angel. We must be willing to be present with the presence. When we are fully open, we may be astonished by the gift of presence, a gift by which we are infused with gratitude and humility. Will you take time today to be present with presence? All else comes and goes, but the presence does not. So I invite your questions or comments. Um, one comment I had, I recently organized um, a workshop with Maria Salero in Denver. She's a, a philosophy professor and climate change educator. And uh, she goes over the concept of climate courage because she says we have to let these emotions get to us, but not over overwhelm us so we can still stay active. And I'm uh, that's one of the reasons I came tonight, because I thought this was a wonderful confluence of, of thinking. Thank you. So yeah, um, I'm sure that when we really sit with the reality of climate change in 440 parts per million and climbing, um, we have some fear. And, uh, and we probably have some regret. And, and, and we have to at some point look at our own part 
Not that we beat ourselves up with it, but you know, we've all participated with our living arrangements. And then there's the deep grief. Definitely the deep grief. And I'm glad to hear that the, the professor is, is inviting us to look at those emotions because that's part of the problem. You know, climate change is out there, I don't feel anything. Oh yeah, 400 parts per million, you know. Um, so, but when we begin to feel the emotions, then it's a whole different story. You were gonna say something. Well, there's just so many thoughts that are going through this talk. I am a strong believer in being able to change consciousness. And I've found meditation to be very powerful as far as dealing with emotions. And even just in the past year, really learning that emotions only really last about 30 seconds. They pass, they flow. But when we hold on to them, that's when they be, really become stuck and buried. And um, I don't know, I think I'm just rambling. Um, but when you were talking about the presence and through me and that each of us have that sacred space, if we can just let everything flow, um, and what's funny about that is I just went and got a psychic feeling before I came here and then these two lovely women sat next to me and they were so pulling me into these groups and organizations that are going on around here that it was a little overwhelming. So um, if we do go in, magic does happen. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. I'm really um, contemplating what it means to um, uh, educate my six-year-old daughter, <laughs> or how, how do I talk to her about what is. Well, I wouldn't start by talking about 440, um, but certainly to be honest about what's going on in the climate and lots of walks and talks in nature and a real appreciation for the species and developing in her a real love and a passion for nature. Um, this, is a, this is an issue that comes up all the time, you know, people saying, what about my children and grandchildren? Now, my friend Guy McPherson, when people say, what about my children and grandchildren, he says, what about you? Because, you know, uh, this is not out there somewhere like a thousand years from now. Um, but that kind of honesty and um, just gentle little by little sharing about it. Um, and then there will come a time when she'll start asking the really tough questions, uh, especially, especially as things get worse. And my heart, my heart is with you in terms of having to, to deal with that. But you know, that too is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for connection between the two of you an opportunity for deep connection with nature um, that maybe you wouldn't have had otherwise. And I see the tears. I get it. Yeah. Following up on her question, I have nieces and nephews and other people in my life me approaching children has included some wonderful children's books. Um, there's one on Wangari Matai. I think it might be the woman who planted trees or something like that, but Wangari Matai won the Nobel Peace Prize about six or seven years ago. She was part of this movement called the Green Belt Movement. Yeah. And um, they've planted 40 million trees, I'm counting. Mm. There are a couple of nice children's books on Rachel Carson. Yes, well. yes. So finding material like that mm -hmm. is, um, is a fun way to approach kids. And I don't know, I enjoy children's books still. Yeah. Seven, yeah. So enjoy them. And um, Frances Moore LePay came to mind during your talk. Mm -hmm. She wrote a book called Eco Mind. Uh -huh. And she also has been thinking a lot about these issues. Sustain our hearts. Yes. And our and all that. And um, she, she expresses in many ways she's not an optimist, but she does see possibilities. Mm -hmm. and, and personally, just the creative 
good work going on in the world all around us. I'm, I'm sure if we were to get into discussion, we'd learn of all kinds of organizations, right. and urban gardens, and organic. It's around us. So that right. to me is the joy part. Yes. You know, the despair. Yes. Still, there's joy. And you found you bet there is. And, you know, I, I want to say something else on the coattails of the question about children. Um, one of the things we need to cultivate in ourselves and in our kids is good manners toward the earth. And doing everything we can to help other species, to make it easier on them. Yes? It's not just good manners, I think it's a connectivity. Mm -hmm. with the earth. I see, mm -hmm. um, I work a lot with middle school and high school students, and there's just a total disconnect between that gum wrapper or that candy wrapper or that aluminum can. It all goes into one place, and it's all getting recycled, mm -hmm. they think, and then that's mm -hmm. that out of sight, out of mind. Right. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, um, when I heard that Mike Rupert had died, I went online and I listened to the podcast of his last show on which you were with mm -hmm. him. Didn't you say something on there to the effect that sometimes you just need to disconnect yourself from uh, media, you need to turn off the computer, turn off oh, yeah. the TV and so oh, yeah. forth? And I think that's another message that we somehow, it's not an easy message to get across to the younger generation because there's so much power in that, in oh, being yeah. connected like that. But um, I think being able to help them disconnect and feel mm -hmm. okay about it, and mm -hmm. that it's okay to connect face to face and not mm -hmm. always just be connected right. with this random um, lot of things that yeah. are rolling around out there in the universe. Yeah, they're going to get sucked into that. There's no way they won't. But the more we can help them see that there's another way as well, you know, to, to create some balance, you know, that that's not the only way to connect. Yeah, Michael. Um, just sort of extending the, the, the theme of, of children, I, I, I find myself thinking a lot these days about uh, the relationship of those of us who, who are aware of these things, who are in our 60s or 70s, with younger adults you know, who, who are aware, you know, and many of them are angry at the world that they are inheriting. Right. So, so my question is, what what are you learning about eldering to younger adults? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, when I was teaching, when I was still teaching in college, uh, psychology and history, um, I used to start every class. The last couple of years, I would start every class with um, first day. I want to apologize to you, and they go, what? And I want to apologize to you for what my generation has done to yours. And I'd go, oh, man, this is the greatest country in the world. And I'd say, well, by the end of the semester, you'll understand why I'm apologizing. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. So I do a lot of that. And um, I had the wonderful privilege in December of going down to University of Kentucky and, and meeting with a bunch of activists young people there who are students, and, um, and students who were reading Charles Eisenstein, and, um, and, and really had a, a great consciousness. And, um, you know, I was able to hear their anger. But for a lot of them, they're not living in anger. A lot of them are doing things, you know. Um, they're, they're really choosing alternative careers. There are, many of them are dropping out of school. They're choosing not to have student debt until they're 85 and, and do other things. And some of them are becoming organic farmers, and some, some of them are becoming herbalists and, you know, all kinds of different things, alternatively. Um, so there is a lot of anger, but I also see some signs of um, taking another path using other options, and, you know, my heart not only goes out to them, but my hat goes off to their courage and their creativity, with which I am very impressed, actually. Yeah. 
So I recently got involved with a thriving change maker summit, which started out in the Bay Area and it's going to be in December, or uh, the DC area in November. It's incredible what these young things are putting together. I know. I'm on their support team. All right, good for you. You're eldering as well. <laughs> yes. It's, it's phenomenal what they're creating. They've yeah. already tapped 50 of the young nonprofit, they created nonprofits mm. and the XL pipeline kids. Yeah. And they're working with them so that they can see who they are and not burn out. And yeah. this thriving change maker summit that mm -hmm. goes over three and a half, four days mm -hmm. is phenomenal. These mm -hmm. these young things have real clarity when they're finished as to what their purpose in life and what they're doing. And you know, you talked about burnout, and I just want to say something because, um, and I ran into this not just with older people, but with young people as well, is the importance of grief. And if you're just fighting and fighting and angry and angry, and you don't get that grief out, um, you're going to fry. You just will. And you know, grief is water, <laughs> and, and the anger is fire. And so when you can balance the fire with the water, amazing things can happen. Yeah, man. Time to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Scott's got a question, and then. Okay. Yeah. Then I'll sign books up here. Okay, Scott. So I'm curious about a typical day in the life. Just wondering if you have a core practice um, that that you use for your own resilience. Yes. Well, I'll tell you a typical day, and it may shock you, um, so hang on to your cookies. Um, no, I get up and um, I drink coffee. It's a no-no, but I drink coffee. Um, I get up and I meditate first, and then I drink coffee, and then I do some spiritual readings, and I do some journaling, a big segment of journaling. Um, and then I go work on the Daily News Digest, and that takes about two hours or maybe sometimes three, to gather and sort and bundle and send out the news. I have it. It's a subscription-based thing. And then I may have. Uh, then I go to the gym, usually, and then I um, usually talk to coaching clients in the afternoon. Uh, then I maybe start working on the news for the next day, or I answer a bunch of emails, and then. <laughs> I have certain programs. I'm not one of these righteous people. Oh, I don't have television. I'm so above that. I have some programs I like to watch. And there's crap that I don't watch, but there's some programs I like to watch. And don't talk to me about email, and don't talk to me about the computer. And I snuggle with my dog in a big chair, and I watch TV or movie and get up and do it all over again the next day and hang out with friends and on the weekend and stuff like that. When do I write my books? Well, it's a good question. I've got one in the oven, which will be out in January, called Love in the Age of Ecological Apocalypse, The Relationships We Need to Thrive. And I don't know, and then I, I've got a possibility of doing, it's very possible I'm going to do a book with Guy McPherson. So. We shall see, but yeah. And I've got a radio show now. <clears throat> Sunday night, Progressive Radio Network, prn.fm. Uh, it's 7 p.m. Boulder time, and it's always archived, and you can see it the next day. Watch it the next day. Hit, listen to it the next day. Thank you all for coming. And I'll be up here to sign books. <clears throat>